So CO2 transport in the bloodstream. CO2, where, where is CO2 coming from? So it's produced in the tissue, it's produced in the cells. So kind of starting from the tissue and working through that uh, venal side of the circulation. From the tissue, CO2 is going to enter the plasma. And we'll actually find some CO2 dissolved in the plasma, but similar to oxygen, it's only a small percentage that's dissolved in the plasma. And the CO2 mostly is going to be circulated associated with the hemoglobin. Uh, however, it's not going to attach to the hemoglobin in the same location that the oxygen attaches. You remember the oxygen attaches to an iron molecule that's found in this thing called the heme group within the protein. CO2, on the other hand, it forms a, uh, a type of hemoglobin, or it creates uh, the formation of hemoglobin that's called carb amino hemoglobin. The only reason that the hyphen's in there is because it's a really long word. This is all one word, carb amino hemoglobin. And I give you the name first because it actually indicates how the carbon dioxide is going to be transported. This first part, carb, is the carbon dioxide, and the amino refers to the fact that the carbon dioxide molecule binds not to the heme group, but binds to the protein itself, so it binds to an amino acid in that protein. So the chemical reaction for creating the carb amino hemoglobin is to take your hemoglobin that has probably just released its oxygen to the tissue, and it combines with the CO2 that is now readily dissolving into the plasma. And whenever you have hemoglobin in the presence of carbon dioxide, it forms that carb amino hemoglobin, which we just abbreviate as HBCO2. So some of our carbon dioxide is going to show up on the, uh, on the amino acid residues of the hemoglobin molecule, carbon dioxide attached directly to the protein, not to the hemoglobin. But not all of it does. We still have some of the CO2 that remains in the um, uh, that remains unassociated with the hemoglobin. So it gets transported from the plasma into the cell, the red blood cell, gets picked up in part by the hemoglobin to form the carbon amino hemoglobin. But once inside of the red blood cell, some of that CO2 gets subjected to a second chemical reaction. And that second chemical reaction is to take carbon dioxide in the presence of water to convert it into a molecule called bicarbonate. So it converts to bicarbonate. And the chemical reaction here is for some of the CO2 in the presence of water to be converted into a molecule called H2CO3, which is called carbonic acid. And then that carbonic acid is, uh, is um, converted into HCO3 that has a minus. Let's make sure I do that right. HCO3 and then an H plus. And that H plus is a proton, that's a hydrogen molecule. So we go from carbonic acid, H2CO3, to bicarbonate and also producing the H here. Now I'm going to rely on biology major, what happens when I increase the concentration of hydrogen in a solution? Okay, it decreases the pH. 
it's becoming more acidic. So as we circulate through the, the tissue, the pH of the solution or of the blood begins to decrease and become more acidic. Now, one of the things that you need to know about proteins, when you subject proteins to a lower pH, so a more acidic environment, they go through this process called denaturation. And as the, uh, the hemoglobin passes through that more acidic part of the blood, it denatures. And whenever something denatures, it loses some of its function, or it cha at least changes some of its function. As the hemoglobin came into the tissue, that its function was to carry oxygen. CO2 is now being subjected to this chemical reaction here, which results in the change in pH because we're producing hydrogen ions. So the blood's becoming more acidic. That causes the hemoglobin to denature. It no longer effectively carries oxygen, which is actually okay because we're right where the oxygen needs to be delivered. We're in the tissue. The carbon dioxide needs to be picked up by the hemoglobin. In this denatured state, there's actually a higher affinity for the carbon dioxide to bind to the hemoglobin. So this becomes a really, really important reaction to deliver oxygen where it's required to be delivered and to pick up, pick up the carbon dioxide where it's being produced. This particular reaction occurs in the red blood cells, RBCs. And the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called carbonic, carbonic anhydrase. And carbonic anhydrase is going to catalyze both of these reactions, both the conversion of CO2 and HO2, H2O, carbon dioxide and water, to my carbonic acid. And then the next step to take that carbonic acid and to convert it into my bicarbonate and my hydrogen. Creating hydrogen, decrease pH, become more acidic, reduce the efficiency of the hemoglobin to carry oxygen, increase the efficiency of the hemoglobin to carry the carbon dioxide. So right where we need the oxygen, we get into a situation where the pH causes the oxygen to be released much easier. If we didn't have that carbonic anhydrase uh, enzyme, life would be totally impossible because we'd never deliver oxygen the way that we need to deliver oxygen in our condition. Now, on this side here, I now have a slightly more acidic environment all the way back up to the LV line. Now what do I need to do? I need to increase pH back up to the optimal level so that the hemoglobin can get back into that form that carries oxygen really, really well. As we move up here to the alveoli, CO2 begins to leave the bloodstream into the alveoli to be breathed out, to be put back into the environment. And so what happens is this um, whole equation begins to go backwards. The CO2 begins to disappear, and so that CO2 has to be replaced in order to stay in equilibrium, and so we add the hydrogen back onto the bicarbonate, which forms the carbonic acid. The carbonic acid then is split to form CO2 and water. That CO2 is continually being pulled out, and so the hydrogen ion is continually disappearing up here in the LV line. Hydrogen ion is produced here, and it's reversed here. So it's produced here because the CO2 is coming out in large abundance. And it's being reversed here because the CO2 is being lost in the environment. So it's actually going to be due to that ventilatory process, breathing, to reverse the blood pH as we go through the capillaries of the pulmonary uh, circuit. And this facilitates the effective binding of oxygen to the hemoglobin to be out there that comes to the, um, to the working tissue. 
So we have to have carbonic anhydrides. So what are possible? Give you a second to get everything down. That's the respiratory system. We're going to move to um, a new physiological system here in just a second. We're going to take a look at the lymphatic system. I want to make sure everybody's got everything they need before we really shift gears. Any questions on anything you've talked so far? Lots of questions on what you've talked about so far. Yes. So the idea that that's just created from the chemical reaction of the blood, right? Yeah. And remember, I, I don't know if you remember or not, but the definition of pH, pH equals minus the log concentration of hydrogen. I'm sure you've seen that before and you don't really know what that means. This reads concentration of hydrogen in the mathematics here leads towards as hydrogen ion concentration increases this results in a decrease a lower number for pH which is acids closer to one is an acid on the other side as you reduce hydrogen ions in a solution this increases pH so in mathematics, this means that you're getting a higher number, closer to 14 on the pH scale. That's alkaline or basic. So that's what the chemical reaction is doing, is it's just modifying that concentration of hydrogen down here in the tissue so that it increases hydrogen ions to in, uh, decrease the pH, make it more acidic. And then as you breathe off the CO2, that whole equation runs in the reverse direction in the lungs. Good. Any other questions? So if you want to start a new section of notes, or a new outline in your notes, you can call it the lymphatic system. Now the lymphatic system is dedicated to protection and defense of the organism. Why do we need protection and defense? Well, it's because death is lingering around every corner. Because there are organisms that are all around you. And if many of these organisms that are around us are allowed to perpetuate in an organism or in the human body, this leads towards disease, and many of these diseases are not treated our organs can fail. Fortunately, we have our own defense system in the lymphatic system, which is the house or the home to the immune system that helps out with this process of defending and protecting our physiological organ systems from these, um, these organisms that can cause disease. Now, these organisms, uh, when they can cause disease, we call them a pathogen. And there are many different pathogens that exist, many different types of pathogens that exist. Uh, I want to take a moment to highlight just a few of these pathogens, just in general terms. Uh, in particular, we're actually going to look at three of these pathogens. Now, surprisingly enough, pathogens don't really make a whole lot of sense to have existed. Um, before the fall, there was no death, and now these things can kill you. So, why would we actually have a pathogen created? that can cause death if there was no death before the fall. If the punishment of sin is death, pathogens make absolutely no sense. And I say all of that to say that when you look at pathogens, there are many that can cause death, 
but that's probably a product of sin and a product of uh, the things that happened in the Garden of Eden. But they existed beforehand, and so they actually probably had some sort of beneficial properties. And we actually see a lot of those beneficial properties. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of those as well. So pathogens, don't just think of bacteria as being all bad. There are some bacteria that, just like humans, have been subjected to uh, uh, subjected to, to sin and, and sin throughout the last 6,000 years of, of existence, right? So just like scripture says, that even the whole creation is really in the, in the grass of sin. So these pathogens are a result of basically human, human action. And when you think of things like bacteria, and here's a picture of what bacteria look like, you probably think of, oh, you're going to have a bacterial infection and I need to go get an antibiotic. Well, in reality, bacteria are a diverse group of organisms. They are considered to be the most successful organism on the planet. And the reason that they're the most successful organism on the planet is because they basically establish colonization in every environment, in every condition type around the world. And in fact, right now, around you, there are trillions and trillions and trillions of individual bacteria all around you right now, even though you can't see them because they're so microscopic. One of the things that bacteria can do that a lot of uh, other organisms can't do, including humans, is they can collect the raw materials that they need to survive just about anywhere. They can pull it from sewage. They can pull it from decomposing matter or even bacteria that have been shown to be able to pull uh, raw nutrients, carbon dioxide, right out of the environment to use that as a carbon source and oxygen right out of the environment. So they can collect raw nutrients and raw materials just about everywhere. If I put you guys in a uh, sewage treatment plant and say you can only utilize the sewage for your survival, you probably call it not because I don't think she's going to die for you. So, Oh, that just got really gross, didn't it? It was a terrible example. Just stricken that from the record. Now, even though we think of bacteria typically as being bad, we don't want bacteria, and really some, maybe I'm going to even say many, provide humans with some sort of benefit. And even some that we think, oh my gosh, that's a really bad bacteria, there's actually been shown to be some beneficial attributes for even some of the worst bacteria that we know about that can kill a human in a matter of days. So there are bacteria that certainly provide benefit. Bacteria are not all geared just to kill you. And in fact, right now, your body weight you can contribute or attribute more of your body weight to the weight of the bacteria that exists in your own body than to your own cells that make up your own body. You have bacteria in all different locations, many different locations throughout the organism. One of the big places is in the gut, and you have this uh, group of bacteria called the gut bacteria are called the glut, the glut, the gut flora. And these gut bacteria do a variety of things. Uh, one of the things that the bacteria will do that are in your gut is they'll extract nutrients from our food that we consume that if the bacteria wasn't present, we wouldn't actually be able to extract on our own. There are different vitamins and minerals that these gut bacteria actually can pull out of food and help you digest that you would not be able to, 
to digest that are required for normal physiological uh, processes of metabolism. Things like some of our vitamins come from bacteria. The other thing that these gut bacteria do that's really, really important is they don't make you sick. They actually help you. It's a symbiotic relationship between you and the bacteria. And one of the uh, one of the results of this symbiotic relationship, besides these two things we've already mentioned, is when they colonize the gut, these good bacteria, so to speak, control the populations of harmful bacteria. So control the population of harmful bacteria. So if you eat, you know, I don't know, a piece of cantaloupe that has bad bacteria in it, you have a much higher probability of the many those bacteria colonizing the gastrointestinal tract because these uh, non-harmful, these beneficial bacteria are going to use up the resources and uh, take up the space that that harmful bacteria could, could utilize or, or could, uh, the space that it could take up. So we have gut bacteria that are very beneficial. We also have several industrial uses for bacteria. Um, how many of you like yogurt? Pretty amazing stuff, right? Every time you consume yogurt, you look at the back of the container, and you may read, made with active yogurt cultures, including L. acidophilus, or there's a couple others. That's a bacteria. L. acidophilus is a bacteria. And the reason that bacteria is in the yogurt is because it helps in the production process to make that yogurt. And when you consume the yogurt, you consume that bacteria, and that bacteria is actually um, going to be a beneficial bacteria for it's been shown that L. acidophilus keeps pretty good it's been shown to help all with regulating gut health and digestive system health. So industrial uses, um, as shown here, we use bacteria in many different food production processes, many of our dairy processes. Cheese is another example. Um, we also use it in places like beer production as well. So many industrial uses in food production. And then we also provide, uh, or utilize, I should say, many different types of bacteria to generate the antibiotics that you go to the doctor to get when you have a biological infection, bacterial infection. So we actually use the bacteria themselves to grow and to produce many of the chemicals that act as antibiotics in another class of medicinals called biologics. And in fact, there's a um, variety of different cancer drugs that are actually generating the bacteria as well. One of them is doxorubicin, anthracycline. These are all generated in bacteria. And so when you go into a place that produces chemotherapeutic drugs, they're going to have a, a culture facility where they're generating bacteria that produce those antibiotics. Now, certainly, There are some bacteria that are harmful and can cause very serious medical problems and even can lead towards death. So we have to be able to control bacteria. And the number one defense that we have against bacteria is our lymphatic system. And we're going to talk about the lymphatic system and how it works. The second most um, beneficial bacterial control mechanism we have is just using the antibiotics, many of which are producing bacteria themselves. So as we break down the lymphatic system, you're going to begin to see how we actually naturally control bacteria. You're going to go up to lunch today, or maybe you're going to eat a little commercials, and you're consuming bacteria. And you probably don't want all those bacteria to end up inside. Yeah. So there's some things that we do to prevent uh, overexposure to bacteria as you consume your food. Everybody's probably in the kitchen right now. I don't know if I should finish drinking this. Uh, a second pathogen are the viruses. And viruses are pretty 
crazy. How many of you can name a virus that does something good? So why the heck do viruses exist? I mean, at least with the bacteria, yeah, we have some that um, they do some real harmful things, but at least there's others that look like there's some sort of heritage that was important for human health and the bacteria probably at one time they cause disease and death. But viruses, every time we talk about viruses, it's in relationship to a disease. So why does a virus exist? And we'll get to that answer here in just a second. But let's first take a look at some viruses. So viruses are extremely tiny. <coughs> the average size for a virus is about one one thousandth the size of a eukaryotic cell. So one one thousandth the size of eukaryotic cells. So here, this is a TEM, which stands for transmission electron microscopy picture. So this is um, basically magnification probably of about 100,000 times. With the light microscopes that you used earlier this semester, the best you could use about 1,000 times magnification. This is about 100,000 here probably. And there are three different viruses that are on a very small patch of membrane. Uh, of a eukaryotic cell. Uh, and this is just one type, one structure of bacteria. There's a or not bacteria, viruses, I should say. There's a, uh, a variety of different structures for bacteria, for viruses as well. But they're all really small, very tiny, um, very tiny compared to the size of a eukaryotic cell. They also exist in a very simple structure. exists in a very simple physical structure that contains genetic material. And if you look in the head, or what's called the capsid, this structure encapsulates a DNA or an RNA molecule, a genetic molecule that holds the genetic information. So the capsid it's made up of proteins. So you have the DNA and you have the encapsulating proteins. The DNA actually holds all the information to generate those proteins so that new viruses can be produced. There are no organelles. And in fact, there's really no machinery to generate copies of a virus. The genetic information is there to produce the capsid proteins and the sheath proteins and the base plate and all that stuff. But there's no machinery to make those things. So in order for a virus to replicate and to generate new viruses, they're going to require help to reproduce. And that help to reproduce comes from an or another organism cell. And the virus actually is going to capture and take over that cell. And it's going to inject, which is what you can see happening here. This is the DNA fragment being injected into that cell. And as it injects into that cell, the enzymes and the other molecules that help that cell to generate its own genetic information and the proteins and things like that becomes hijacked. And the cell begins to produce the proteins of the capsid and of the sheath, etc. So it takes over the cell, dumps its DNA into that cell, and then uses the cell's machinery to make new viruses. And 
then you get new viruses that get built up and that get produced and built up in the cell, and eventually the cell breaks, releasing those viruses into the surrounding tissue. More cells are hijacked, more viruses are produced, and you can begin to see what happens here. You're destroying the cells, you're producing more viruses that will destroy more cells, produce more viruses to destroy more cells, and it's this perpetual cycle. Viruses are classified as non-living tissue. I'm sorry, not tissue. They're classified simply as non-living. Non but that's the data between biologists. Um, some biologists say, well, they have all the makings of a living organism. However, if you go back to classic biological definitions, definition of life is that it begins at the cellular level. There are no cells in a virus, so there is no capability to be living. So I actually believe that we classify viruses as not living organisms that can interact with living systems. But that's a uh, up for debate. Well, not really in my mind, but some people would say that it's up for debate. Kind of change the constitution. Let's change itself here. So, how do we control viruses? And I began this whole conversation with can anyone think of a virus that's a good, a good virus? Viruses have gone pretty rogue since creation. They've existed since the beginning of creation because God created all things in the beginning. And they were created not causing death. I'm very confident in that statement based off of a uh, scriptural understanding. But they've gone rogue. And now many viruses, they do create problems for many different organisms. And there's really not an organism that does not have a virus that attacks. The bacteria have viruses that attack. The plants have viruses that attack. Them. Animals, humans have viruses that attack them. So one of the best ways to control viruses is to wash your hands. It's a control and a prevention method. To just simply wash your hands at the time you use the bathroom or before you consume a meal. You can wash your hands to try to wipe away as many of those viruses to get rid of as many of those viruses as possible. There's also a class of drugs that are called antivirals. And you maybe have influenza as a virus, right? And we're in a pretty bad influenza season right now, lots of people getting the flu. If you catch the flu early enough, which is almost before you begin to develop symptoms, there is a antiviral treatment that they can give you that is reasonably effective, not at eliminating the flu, but at reducing the time in which it takes for you to um, get over the flu. You know, typically flu takes maybe seven to ten days to fully recover. But the antiviral, if it's applied right at the very beginning of onset of uh, the viral development process, you may be able to get over the flu in three or five days instead of that whole seven to ten days. So the antivirals that are available right now have minimal effectiveness. It just seems that when you're dealing with viruses, early treatment is probably going to be key. Um, you've probably um, heard before that there's ways in which you can reduce the probability of um, HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, um, the effects of the virus for, uh, after exposure to have that uh, immediate cocktail, viral, antiviral cocktail given. Um, but again, it, it takes knowing very, um, with very little information, very little symptomology that you've been exposed to a virus from these antivirals to work really effectively. All right, so I started the conversation on viruses. Anyone thought of a virus that's good? Good virus? I want to go get this virus. So really the answer to the question is no, there are no good viruses, but viruses have become very good tools. And I believe that viruses were created at the beginning of creation because of the util utility that the viruses had. So I can take a virus 
And I can take that DNA out of that virus, the native DNA, and I can put my own DNA molecule in there. And I can use that virus. And a lot of times viruses will target specific tissues or specific organisms and specific tissues in that organism. And in that DNA molecule, I can genetically engineer it to carry, let's say, a chemotherapy. Normally, chemotherapy, they basically give you the global dose, and it's really nasty. You lose your hair, and all of these really bad things happen. You feel terrible as you go through the chemotherapy. And if we're really honest about it, it doesn't really always effectively get rid of cancer that, that well. They're now using an approach where they take a virus, they denude or get rid of the DNA molecule, they put in a new DNA molecule that has the sequence that can generate or be used to produce the chemotherapeutic, chemotherapy drug, and then they give you the virus and that virus circulates. And it goes specifically, if they, they can program it or genetically engineer the virus, they go specifically to the tumor or the location in the tissue where the cancer uh, exists. And we can use that DNA and begin to get a very focused dosage of that Um That's not the only application. We can do very similar things. If I want to knock out a gene, I can get a viral vector that I can program to go and knock out a specific gene. So in research, we're using, a, we're using viral vectors for research to help get a very specific, like if I just want to knock out a specific gene in a specific muscle tissue or a specific tissue and not globally throughout the whole organism, I can use viruses to do that. So I think that this was one of those things that was created that does absolutely cause some pretty severe problems, but we really can we really know how to control viruses. We, we have all sorts of prevention me uh, mechanisms. Viruses used to be one of the leading causes of death uh, around the world, and now very few people die from influenza. Very few people, and, and to be totally honest, probably the uh, virus that causes the most uh, the most deaths around the world is HIV, which is a 100% preventable viral disease. 100% preventable. And the only reason that we have issues is because there's societal norms and other um, uh, other cultural things that allow the, the virus to perpetuate within populations all over the world. So viruses, even though they're bad things overall, we know really how to handle and control those viruses as a, as, a, as a medical culture. And now we're beginning to see some really vital uses as we progress for treatment of diseases and to understand um, scientific um, discovery, make scientific discoveries and things like that. So there's the answer. There's the, the, benefic the beneficial nature of the virus, probably created knowing that someday we would need to rely on the technology that can arise and the utility that can arise out of viruses. How long does it take to I'm sorry? How long does it take us for treatment of cancer? We're just getting to the point where we're beginning to see clinical trials. We've been, well, it's a viral vector treatment. And, and, and we've been using it um, for the last 10, 10 to 12 years, really successfully over the last couple of years to give a really targeted um, production of a gene or knockout of a gene in, a, in an organism. So if I have some gene of interest, maybe I'm really interested in uh, cystic fibrosis. And I can use a little mouse model and I can create mice that after they've gone through development, I can give them cystic fibrosis gene specifically in a lung tissue or in liver tissue. So it's all really new stuff. But I mean, when you survey the, the world around you, and you kind of place that back on um, the notion that at one time, all things were created, and there was no death. Think about a shark. Think about, I mean, a shark, when you see a shark, the only thing that you can consider is that thing was created to murder. That it was created to kill. Which makes no sense in the context that the one time shark probably ate itself. It's not really the same way. It was not a carnivore. Because carnivore means that you have to have death of an organism. Alright.
So prions. How many of you have ever heard of prions? One of you. This is the serious disease. <laughs> a prion is actually a protein that has, they say, gone rogue. Uh, it's a protein that no longer functions the way that it is supposed to function. So you have the normal prion protein, and then that protein denatures. It, it changes its form, which changes its function, and it becomes a disease-causing prion. And this disease-causing prion, a lot of them affect the brain, and they begin to destroy the brain tissue. And you all can kind of see where this is going to go. The thing that's scary about it is this prion disease. All it has to do is make contact with another non prion disease, uh, or another non prion causing protein, and that non prion protein becomes a rogue protein. And so, very quickly, you get build up of these rogue proteins inside of things like the brain tissue. And there's some pretty severe things that begin to happen. I'm going to show you some pictures of what happens with these rogue proteins. So again, a prion is just simply a protein, and that protein misfolds. And again, these proteins are normally found in the brain. And they exhibit this self-propagating principle, this self-propagating ability. Meaning that one causes one uh, abnormally folded prion protein causes another protein to become an unfolded prion protein. Now, what begins to happen is these proteins build up inside of the cell. The cell has a limited volume, and as those proteins build up, more and more become misfolded. We overstuff that cell. And in particular, in the brain, we overstuff our nerve cells. And as those nerve cells begin to overstuff, eventually they burst. And what happens when they burst? They release all of those misfolded proteins into the surrounding tissue. And this catalytic cycle just continues. So they burst and they release all of those prions and more cells are now going to be affected. So we're losing our neurological tissue. We're lo losing our neurons as this disease progresses. And pretty soon the brain begins to become more spongy and it loses its normal, uh, its normal structure. It also is going to lead towards some pretty severe neurological function. So we get this pretty severe neurological dysfunction occurring. To make matters even worse, the prion is resistant. And what that means is if you cook uh, muscle tissue that has prion, the cooking doesn't get rid of the prion. If you freeze it, Freezing doesn't affect the prion. It's dry out. Drying doesn't uh, affect the, uh, the prion, which are like the three main ways in which we handle food production uh, after we pull it off the farm. <coughs> so, the moral of the story here is the prion, once they form, they're pretty hard to get rid of. Now, my guess is that you've probably heard of diseases before that are prion-based diseases. Anyone happen to know one? How many of you have heard of mad cow disease? So mad cow disease is a prion disease. So mad cow disease affects cattle. 
Unfortunately, if you were to eat beef from a cow that was infected with mad cow disease, those prions also are going to affect you. And so there are some human equivalents of the disease. We're going to get to a couple here in just a second. Uh, here's some examples of what happened with prion disease. So here is a normal brain. And you can see it's very full. This is the third ventricle. It's supposed to be open like that. Here is the prion infected disease. You can see that we've had a lot of loss of tissue. That means that we've lost a lot of our neurological ability. And this poor cow up here, I don't know if you can all see that or not, but the cow can no longer really, doesn't have the muscle dexterity uh, or muscle control to be able to stand and go and function as a cow. Normally, what they would do with a cow 20 years ago with a cow like this is they'd sacrifice it. And a standard in cattle production would be to take that cow that was diseased, grind it up, put it in the cow food, and feed it to all the rest of the cattle. Prions resist cooking, freezing, and drying. They, they resist um, these processes. And so when you feed a prion diseased cow to another animal, all those other animals get prion disease. And about 20 years ago, they had to ban that. Um, they had to ban that type of food processing and carcass and storage, it's carcass and disposal, especially in Europe, because large swaths of cattle even died because of bad cow disease. The situation in cow and in cattle is bad, but. If any of this beef were, make, were to make it to market and it was prion tainted beef and humans were to consume it, humans would be infected by prion disease. Uh, and there, up until 2013 or 2014, there had never been recorded cases of human prion disease in the United States. There have now been a half a dozen prion diseases in the United States, a disease called Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. In certain parts of uh, Indonesia, uh, where cannibalism is actually still practiced, there's a higher rate of a prion disease in those areas called Kuru. Kuru is basically a Kreutzfeldt Jakob type prion disease. Um, obviously, if you consume a human that is infected with prion, you can prion yourself, and so it will be transmitted through these cannibalistic tribes in uh, remote parts of Indonesia as well. So how is Kreutzfeldt Jakob mostly spread? Because most of us don't consume our neighbor. So I hope not. So the major vector of spread is through consuming prion infected beef. Now, fortunately, rates of prion disease in cattle have dropped significantly since we banned certain practices for carcass disposal. But imagine this. Imagine that you have a group of cattle and they become infected with prion and that prion begins to move to call a full herd. Cows live outside. They may live in a fence, but they live outside and they interact on a daily basis with other organisms, deer, birds, other organisms. So prion can cross across that organismal barrier. And if you have exposure of elk or less to cattle that have a prion, you now have a wild organism that has free range around the, around the, the landscape carrying the prion disease. And that can become really, really scary. I reviewed a, a, a research project at one point. Um, that wanted to look at prion disease, and they wanted to begin to uh, create prion, uh, prion protein in the fruit fly. Have you ever um, seen a fruit fly on campus? Most likely you've seen fruit flies on campus because we've bred fruit flies before, and they, they get out. Fruit flies just get out everywhere. So could you imagine being in a facility where they're doing prion research on fruit flies? Where do you see a fruit fly? I think they'd be carrying prion disease. And yeah, not a great profit.
So how can we control the disease? I'm almost out of time. I'm probably totally out of time. All right. Give me uh, two more seconds. One more minute. Controlling the disease, one, there's no cure. The cattle production is probably our biggest threat to expansion of prion disease. And so the strategies to control the disease are centered on preventing the spread of cattle. And that's why beef cattle are no longer fed tissue of other cattle that have died. You actually have to incinerate those cattle uh, to uh, get rid of the carcasses. It's a lot cheaper just to grind it up and throw it in the feed, but uh, that's very dangerous when prion disease could be present. Now, I said prion was the scariest. It really is not because there's not been a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of uh, cases of prion disease in the United States. Um, and there really hasn't been any for a couple of years now. We had, in, I think it was 2013, we had six different cases in just in this little remote area that had an outbreak. And it's now been for All right, so I'll see you on Friday. Thank you.